You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you all doing today? Well, we have just returned from taking our firstborn to university for the first time. Oh, my goodness. What a day. <laughs> the highlight or or not for me was it was quite a traumatic day it's fair to say we were all quite tense and we were helping our daughter unpack and something had leaked like a hair conditioner had leaked and gone everywhere and that wasn't helping the situation and I was trying to put stuff away and my husband was trying to help and lighten the atmosphere and so he he said oh give that to me and I'll dry it out and I said it's a roll of sellotape. You can't dry out a roll of sellotape. And he said, no, no, give it to me and I'll try. So I gave him this, this roll of sellotape that was so wet, you know, it was leaking conditioner, warped in size, handed it to him. and He just looked at it and then blew on it as if that would just somehow dry it out. I know he did it for humour and it was. I then started laughing in a way that I think gave away the fact that uh, I was on another level of stress that day. But anyway, never mind. We all survive. We all move on, don't we? It's all it's all good. But I believe the sellotape is still a little damp. So there we are. Anyway, I have got some books. I have got some books to tell you about today. Quite a range. Something to suit every reading preference, I think, today. Some you're going to listen to this and then think Philippa has completely lost the plot and you'd be right but never mind let's go for it I haven't lost the plot with the first two books I should say that well and more than two. Oh dear she's waffling anyway what books are we talking about today we are talking about you could be so pretty by Holly Bourne and Holly is going to come on and talk to us about this very important book then we've got Chasing the Dragon by Mark Whiteman and Mark's going to come on and talk to us about that book as well then I'm going to review three books that I've listened to as audiobooks. The first one is called The Trial by Rob Rinder. Rinder? Rinder? Him. The next one is called Bad Blood by Lorna Sage. Did that as a book club book, things to say. And then the final one, prepare yourself for this, is entitled... <laughs> is entitled... The... <laughs> the Little Elephant Who Wants to Fall Asleep. And I have things to say about that book. If you have trouble sleeping, listen on. Anyway, let's get started. So the first book, You Could Be So Pretty, Holly Bourne. Let me read you the blurb of this one. In Belle and Joni's world, there are two options for girls. One, follow the rules of the doctrine like Belle. Apply your mask. Work hard to be crowned at the ceremony. Be a pretty. Or two, fight the rules like Joni. Leave your face bare, work hard to escape to the education, be an objectionable. But maybe there is a third option. Change the rules, reclaim your power. If you can, what would you choose? Wow, this is um, an extraordinary book. Or it's, yes, it's YA, it's young adult, but it's not certainly not for young, young children. But if you're an adult, don't think this isn't a book for you because I think it's very powerful. Anyway, let's talk to Holly now. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the podcast today Holly Bourne, whose latest fabulous book is called You Could Be So Pretty. Holly, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's great to finally meet you, having read your books for many years. Could you start by giving us a bit of a summary of this book? Yes, yeah, so it's a book for teenagers, although I think a lot of adults have been reading it and enjoying it too. Although I don't know if enjoying is the right word for this book because it is a <laughs> dystopia. And yeah, it's called You Could Be So Pretty and it's written as a dystopia, but it's kind of a contemporary teen book looking at the pressures mm. on girls in terms of beauty standard, sort of porn culture and the sort of normalised sexual violence that girls have to put up with when they're trying to just get their education. And I kind of felt like things were so bad and urgently bad that I wanted to write this book using dystopic language and the generic conventions of dystopia to kind of really hammer home just 
how atrocious the conditions are for young girls and women today. And it just follows, yeah, two girls living in this dystopic society. Belle, who is a pretty, who kind of really benefits under this society's sort of constraints because she's very beautiful and she kind of follows all the rules of how she's expected to behave. And then there's Joni, who's an objectionable, who really rejects beauty standards and is trying to fight for a better world and for all of us to kind of break free from the world of the doctrine. But of course, everyone just thinks she's ugly and doesn't listen to her. And it's just sort of telling their two stories as they sort of come across each other and learn from each other, really, about about what, as I said, girls and young women are living Mm. with today. And as you say, yes, it's dystopian, but it says so much about our society now. Was it cathartic to write or did it just make you even angrier? You know, it was, so I spent five years working for a youth charity and helping young people with their sort of sex and relationship issues, their mental health problems. And I think that is what really opened my eyes to just how horrific things are for girls. And I don't use that word lightly. It really is horrific and of just the normal pressures that are expected of them and how they just can't even get to school in their uniforms, like without being sexually harassed and then they're sexually harassed in lessons and then they're pressured to do things in their first sort of romantic relationship sort of that they're not ready for. And so when like everyone's invited sort of really crashed onto the scenes a couple of years ago and the media sort of picked up on it, oh, actually things are really bad for girls. I was like, yeah, I've Mm. known this for years and made me, yes, want to kind of write this book and I think it was cathartic to yeah put pen to paper or well more like fingertips to laptop keys to make sense of the five years that I spent there because it was a really difficult five years you know it was really Mm. hard to Mm. see young people young girls struggling like that and it was a real before and after moment in my life having that job it really opened my eyes up to a lot of things I'm not sure I wanted to know I didn't know if I wanted to see Mm. and so yeah Mm. it was cathartic in that way but obviously the book is telling the truth about an everyday girl's experiences right now and making the case that it, we're living in a dystopic nightmare. And yeah, so it's not cheerful. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping it really helps young girls contextualise and make sense of the pressures they're under rather than at the moment then normalise or even worse, some of the things that are being sold to them like is being sold to them as like empowerment or empowering. And so I'm really hoping book helps them have a framework to understand why they might be feeling scared anxious sad about themselves like they're in constant competition with their friends like nothing they do will ever be enough I'm hoping this book will really provide yeah a kind of blueprint for okay how can I break free from some of these pressures and I think it's interesting because YA as far as I see it has changed so much as a category over say the last 10 years and books now like like your book is Yes, perhaps it has um, a minimum age limit, but it's for everybody. Anybody that knows a young girl, you know, um, whether you're a parent or a friend or a relation, I just think this needs to be sort of read nationally so that people realise how desperate the situation is. Yeah, I really hope so. And I, what was really interesting about the editing process is, you know, my editors who I love, and I've been in YA for over 10 years now, so sort of, yeah, seen the changes that you have mentioned but they kind of kept kind of going oh this might be a bit too much I don't think things are this bad and I'll come back with my research and be like they really mm. are and they were like oh no this is awful <laughs> like it was you know I was like this isn't dystopia I kept having to be like this isn't dystopic I've not fudged mm. these figures or these statistics and it's bleak However, because I spent so long working with young people and had such thorough safeguarding training uh, i I'm so careful with this book and that it does really go there with, you know, sexual pressure and coercion, with porn culture, you know, with cosmetic surgery, you know, it, but I have tried to write about it as safely as possible to make mm. sure that the book is not harmful but helpful. And we even got like a therapist in to do a really, like, really tight line reading to ensure that nothing that would be too upsetting is on page and and it's all, you know, it's more more implied when it needs to be so that it can be put in the hands of a year seven without too much concern, Mm. you know. And of course, what's so sad is year sevens are completely awake to all these pressures anyway. And they've usually seen Mm. porn on their phones by the age of nine or 10. And so it's, 
it is as safe as I can make of this book, but also sadly, it won't be telling young girls anything they don't already know. Mm. And I know you say, well, it, it's a, a a bleak story, but the impact I think it can have on people today could be profoundly positive. I really hope so. I really hope that it just like wakes people up, really. Mm. Um, and just, you know, to just how ludicrous, I mean, beauty pressure is now for young people, especially it's like these high-tech filters you can get now that just glam you up. Mm. Like we just don't ever see like raw, natural girls' faces anymore. We're all, it's just a complete rarity. It's, you know, we're all tweaking ourselves, you know, to kind of have this distorted vision of what a girl is supposed to look like it's face because we're all doing it. It's It shouldn't be revolutionary to just see a face with nothing done to it, but it is. And again, sort of being sold, that's empowering or it's self-care. Or, <laughs> and so what I'm really hoping is it wakes people, up, the young girls up to be like, this is madness that I can't just leave the house and to live yeah. my life. I've got to go through all these processes that are time consuming, they're expensive. Otherwise, I feel terrible about myself. If, you know, I look at all the other girls and they look better than me. It is almost a, a requirement. And that those pressures then play out in terms of, sexual pressures that young people are under as well and academic pressures that they're under and all those sorts of things mm. but I do think waking people up and going this is you are trapped in a web and it's not your fault mm. and there's powerful forces at play here that benefit from you feeling this terrible about yourself and feeling that you need to do all these things and spend all this money in order to just exist and yeah I'm always about don't judge other girls you know don't start mm. attacking girls for wearing makeup going you're wrong you know it's about attack the systems of power that as I said benefit from what they're doing to you and how it's not good mm. for you well it seems a good place to ask you to read us a little bit from the book and it's going to be from the very beginning is that right Holly Yes, it's just the sort of opening page, which is introducing you to, as I said, Belle, who's the sort of compliant one, the pretty in the book. Um, and this is set seven years before the book really begins when she's a child. I'll never forget the sound of my mother's scream. It woke me with a shrillness that pierced my bones and I scrambled up in bed. I was initially too terrified to move, my heart a frantic hummingbird in my chest until I heard a wail that soured the air of our house. I kicked my covers and teddies off, ran to the door and listened at the crack, waiting to hear intruders, but the house was still, apart from my mother's quiet sobbing. With shaking hands, I reached up to twist the doorknob and padded out into the corridor. Mother? I whispered. I found her in the corner of the bathroom, a huddled mess on the bath mat, bent over like a dropped doll. Mother? She flinched and looked up, the moonlight hitting her beautiful, tear-streaked face. She reached out an arm and I went to her instantly. My mother clutched me to her ribcage and wept onto my shoulder. Oh, Belle, she gasped. I tried to pet her back. I didn't know how to help. I was only seven years old. Mother, I'm scared. What's wrong? I can't. I can't. Belle, what am I going to do? They're going to... They're going to make me an invisible. She let go and reached up holding out a thin hair on her head. Do you see it? Oh, Belle! In the night shadow, it took a second to make out the source of her scream. There, in my mother's manicured fingers, was one stray grey hair. My goodness. Yeah, that's a great opening to the book. Can you tell us a little bit more about Belle and Joni? No spoilers, but just a little bit more about what we might expect from them. Well, so yeah, jo Belle is a pretty... And she is works really hard to win the ranking at school every day, you know, and to get, the, you know, she always wins the most validation in school. And there's this <laughs> ceremony coming up at the end of the year and she is determined to be, to win the ceremony and be declared the prettiest. And she also works as a chosen one, you know, as a model. So she, and she has a mum putting her under a tremendous amount of pressure to make the most of her just right years and, you know, be the prettiest and, you know, just kind of really conform to the rules of this society. However, Belle is also very smart and she's been put forward to try and get a scholarship to this, to the education. And then there's Joni, who is an objectionable and who is really 
got her eyes open to the kind of problems of the doctrine. She sort of realizes we're living in a dystopic nightmare and she's always trying to get everybody at school to understand that Belle is everything that's wrong with the world, as it were. They're real like adversaries. But of course, nobody listens to her because they just think she's gross. She's like the butt of all the jokes. But Joni is also put forward for this scholarship to the education. And she sees the education as her way of escaping this like dystopic nightmare. So they're both fighting for the same thing. And they both think that the other one is everything that's wrong and disgusting about the universe. And Holly, I'm interested when you finished writing this book, did, again, no spoilers, but did any of the characters or events stay with you more than in previous books? I think what has been strange since, because it's I finished writing it over a year ago and we've been editing it and getting the cover and it, it comes out on the 28th of September. And I think what's sadly keeps happening in the build up to this book coming out is these increasing reports are coming out in the media sort of proving the book right. Like there was literally just a BBC report out this morning about how most teenage girls say they don't actually feel safe when they're Mm -hmm. outside their house. There's so many reports coming out about pornography. There's so much coming out about body image and eating disorders as a result of of social media. It's And it's just me and my editors and my publicists just keep emailing us going, oh God, it's just, we are living under the doctrine. You know, you kind of write this book because you want people to wake up to things, but you also don't want to be this right, if that makes sense, Mm. because that's not good Mm. for society. So yeah, this book just keeps feeling increasingly relevant. And yeah, so whenever I see yet another story, I'm like, oh God, it is just, you could be so pretty and I wish it wasn't the case. Mm, my goodness. Did the story change as you were writing it or did it stay true to your initial idea? It was. I did actually really plot this book very thoroughly because my ah. previous book I had written in locked and oh. I don't normally plot them and that's never been a problem. But I think I've been trying to create anything in that crazy 18 month period, I think, was hard for anyone because we're all just in this mad, you know, unprecedented elongated survival mode and so I think my last manuscript for my last YA book the yearbook came out at something ridiculous like 170,000 words <laughs> because it's just it took thousands of words to find my way into a scene because it was just such a strange time to live in and so I remember saying to my editor I'm, I'm not doing that to myself again because I basically had to cut certainly like 60,000 words out of a manuscript it was just you know that's like four dissertations <laughs> The words just in the bin. Gosh. So we did we did plot this one really thoroughly. So yeah, it, it didn't change much. And I think because it was following the, the, the constraints of the dystopia or what it needed to feel very fast paced, it needed to feel very claustrophobic. Mm. The cast, you know, is usually very small in a dystopia. It, so it was, it really needed to, and the world building was so important. It was just, yeah, so we really, I knew exactly what was going to happen in each chapter and it did sort of, yeah, write itself in that way. Well, it seems wrong to end on a flippant question given how powerful the book is, but forgive me, that's what we're going to do. Light it up! <laughs> we always have to ask this question of every author, Holly, and that is, what biscuit were you eating? What biscuit was powering the writing of You Could Be So Pretty? I actually wrote this book when I was pregnant. I think I was eating just the entire universe. But i it wasn't a biscuit in that I was eating entire Easter eggs. I think I read something that if you eat chocolate in pregnancy, it makes your baby happier. And I was like, well, this is just for, you know, the good of my child. And I was just like, <laughs> went through at least like three, four Easter eggs a week. And um, yeah, it was an obscene. So yeah, this book was powered by Cadbury's Easter eggs. And that is absolutely perfect. And that makes a lot of sense. It's just wonderful to talk to you and to hear more about You Could Be So Pretty. Holly Bourne, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, one more author interview and more book reviews. And now we go to Chasing the Dragon by Mark Whiteman. You will have heard me review some time ago Mark's previous book called Waking the Tiger, which I really enjoyed. Uh, It's been shortlisted for various prizes. Um, Very good. And this is the next one. Let me read you the blurb of this. Singapore, 1940. A local fisherman finds the body of a missing American archaeologist. Detective Inspector Betancourt of the Singapore Marine Police is first on the scene. 
something doesn't quite add up. He finds out that the archaeologist Richard Fulbright was close to deciphering the previously untranslatable script on a pre-colonial relic known as the Singapore Stone. This was no accidental drowning. Is there more to this case than archaeological rivalries? Betancourt also discovers that Fulbright has been having an affair. He is sure he's on something bigger than just academic infighting. A government opium factory draws criminal interest and in his investigations into the death, Betancourt finds his own life in danger and now he has also put himself on the wrong side of British military intelligence and he is unsure which set of opponents he fears the most. Excellent. Well, let's go and talk to Mark now. Well, it is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today Mark Whiteman, whose latest fabulous book is called Chasing the Dragon. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's very good to have you here. Can you start by giving us a bit of a summary of this book? Yeah, sure. So the Chasing the Dragon is the second in a series that started um, with Waking the Tiger. It introduces a Eurasian policeman who um, works for the Marine Police in colonial Singapore. So the first book was 1939. This is 1940. Um, we learn a bit about Betancourt, which is his name, in the first book. And so this carries on the story. And the, the book opens with, there's a, there's a body found, apparently a drowning, but Betancourt has doubts that it was a drowning. And it turns out to be an, an American archaeologist. When this archaeologist, who was in line for a big prize, when the autopsy is carried out, they find two balls of opium in his stomach. And not surprisingly, that sort of sets the tone of where this, this story is going to go. Because not a lot of people, I think, realise, no reason why they should really, but but opium was legalised and actually run by the British colonial government in Singapore up until the Second World War. You know, so this isn't some sort of Victorian thing. This is a, a comparatively current uh, thing. So, yeah. So, so Betancourt starts off on one track trying to find out what happened to this archaeologist and it leads him down a whole other whole other track. Oh yes. Great. And what can readers expect from the story? I mean, we don't want to give any spoilers away. Yeah. But what what lies ahead? Are there any little crumbs you can give us? Yeah, sure. So so on the one hand, it, it, well, first and foremost, it's a crime story. It's it's a crime novel. It's about um this police detective trying to make sense of things and, and bring people to justice for what what they do. But but there is a lot of history woven into it as well. As I said, kind of two things. One is the pre-colonial history of Singapore. So so he he learns a bit about that during the course of the story. For many people, Singapore started in effect when when Sir Stamford Raffles discovered or bought a part of the island in in the early nineteenth century. But in fact, it has a much much longer history than that. So that comes out with this this dead man being an archaeologist. And then, as I say, there's the whole opium and the, the British colonial attitude to opium. They, they grew massive amounts of, of poppy in, in Bengal and they exported it largely to China, but, but about 15% of it went to the Strait Settlements, Penang, Singapore and Malacca. So there was a, a big social problem with, with opium. And as I say, it was actually run by crazy, but I know, but it was run by the, by the, the government there. So, so we explore some of the, the sort of the morality of that, but, but first and foremost, it's, it's a story about a death. Mm -hmm. And as you've mentioned, we come across Detective Inspector Betancourt, one of the main characters. Can you tell us a bit more about him and his character? Sure. So Betancourt was, was born in Singapore, but he's a, a Portuguese Eurasian. So this, this is a, a group of people, a culture of, of people who kind of came into being in the 16th century when Malacca was a Portuguese colony. A number of Portuguese obviously went out there to work and they married in the, the local Malay women. And then after that, other people arrived from Goa in India, which was also a Portuguese enclave, and they kind of interbred. And so they, they, we come up with this for nowadays, a recognised sort of cultural grouping, racial grouping, known as the Eurasians, as opposed to distinct from people who just happen to be the, the product of a birth between an Asian parent and a, and a European parent. So these Eurasians, they, they, their history is, you know, by the time of this book, about 500 years old. So Betancourt finds this quite amusing or ironic that people talk about, you know, the, the colonial rulers and the locals, meaning the Chinese and the Malays and the Indians that have come to Singapore looking for work and his people who've been in that part of the world for, you know, five or 600 years, 
Yeah, so so he speaks a language called Kristang, and he also speaks English and he speaks bits and pieces of other things, but the, the, the Uri speak a language called Kristang, which came as a Malay corruption of the word Christian. So that's what the Malays call them. They call these Portuguese immigrants Christians. And then Kristang came out. And it's a it's a I believe it's a Creole. I always confuse Creoles and Patois, but it's a Creole language which involves Portuguese and Malay and bits and pieces of other language. So yeah. And he swears in Kristang. Not very much, I have to say. <laughs> How do you get all this knowledge, Mark? How do you find out all this history? So the history is the product of research for the for the most part. Um, I was never terribly interested in history when I was at school or, or you know, even as an adult. Um, I was never that interested in history until I started writing these books and I had to research them. I, so I do have a connection. I grew up in the Far East. I lived in the Far East till I was 21, first in Hong Kong and then in Singapore. So I do have a link to Singapore and it was a link at the time where Singapore was pretty newly independent, so it was, a, it was a country learning how to be a country at the time, but it still had a lot of the old Singapore about it. So I have that those memories, those, those memories in, in my head. So I can imagine some of this, but a lot of it came from history, and it was difficult. It was difficult for the reason that there is very little recorded social history of the people, the, the ordinary working class Asian people in Singapore. So the Malays, the, the Chinese and the Indians, the plenty of stuff about European expats and colonials who wrote their memoirs and that sort of thing. You know, you can find tons of that and loads of stuff about the, the war on the Japanese occupation, which you know, you know, doesn't come into the book at all. But yeah, so I found it very, very hard. And I came across an academic book, a social history book written by an Australian professor named James Warren. And what he, he'd come across the same challenge. And he had gone back to the coroner's records at the time because the coroner's records were the only time when p some people's lives were recorded, their lives and deaths and the circumstances of their lives were recorded. That was, that was the, the only time. So that kind of kicked me off in, in, in understanding how people lived. But the rest of it was just going through the archives. Singapore has a fantastic archive. And so trawling through it, a lot of the, the most helpful stuff actually is visual. So when you go and look at photographs, that shows you how people were living. And that, that was very useful. Newspapers are great as well because they, they kind of bring about what was important to people at the time. But yeah, tons of research, tons of research. Well, it paid off. Can you read us a little bit from the Sure. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll read chapter one. It's, it's short. It's just over a page. It's a, it's a prelude. And what we have here is, is a fisherman. Fishermen at the time would fish for one of those K-longs. They're wooden platforms that sit out in the, in the ocean offshore. And he makes a discovery. The K-long, the fishing platform that acted as both the man's home and the means of him making his living, swayed as the outgoing tide pushed against the wooden pillars holding the structure proud of the water. He gazed across at the shore where distant lights twinkled on Bukit Chandu, the hill named for the government opium factory at its foot, Chandu being the Bengali word for opium. The man finished his business and stood. His knees cracked as he rose to his full height, and he wondered idly where the years had gone. Taking a ladle full of water from a tin reserved for the purpose, he completed his toilet before pulling up his shorts and drawing the string tight. He gazed absent-mindedly down through the hole in the floor. The green sea lapped at the wooden platform and tiny fish darted through flecks of foam, pecking at the algae growing from the mussels that clung to the pillars. Suddenly, a white bundle billowed out from behind one of the wooden pillars. He fished in his shirt pocket for a pair of spectacles, and without unfolding the legs, he placed the frame on the bridge of his nose and squinted. It was a fishing net. Not one of the small throw nets he cast from the platform of his kilong to catch sprats. It was too big for that. Besides, he was fastidious about the care of his own nets. They were his livelihood, after all. And he was sure that if he checked, he'd find his nets pinned to the wooden wall of the Kelong, like gossamer espaliers, just as he'd left them the previous evening before he retired. Returning to the hole in the floor, he peered down again. As he did so, the moon hid behind a cloud, taking its light with it. And it was then that the man perceived the net contained something bulky. As he kneeled to gain a better view, an incoming wave picked up the bundle and thrust it upwards. From the folds in the net, two empty eye sockets peered at him, their contents already surrendered to the swarm of small fish that picked away at the remaining morsels. The man shot to his feet, leant over the side of the kelong, and retched until his stomach was empty. What a great first chapter. You lulled us in with the nice beginning and then wham, we're faced with, with a body. Was that always going to be your opening chapter? 
Yeah, it was actually from from quite an early stage. It's it's, it's difficult. I find it difficult anyway. And knowing how to begin books sometimes. What's the best way of beginning a book? Knowing what you mean to carry on and do later in the story. So I thought get the get the body into play as early as possible. <laughs> Which you certainly do. I mean, we were talking as well about the research that you've done, yeah. and I, I'm interested in how you get the balance between, yes, you've got the facts, but this is a, a fiction book. Absolutely right. And how does that work? I think by setting out to with exactly that intention helps. These are not history books, right? These, these are, are works of fiction. They're, they're, at the end of the day, they're entertainments. You know, people have to be entertained by, by reading these. And so what I, when, I, when I first started writing the series, the first thing I had, before I had any storylines or before I had, even had any characters, is I had the setting. So I'd already started thinking a lot about the setting and a very, very early draft of, of Waking the Tiger, the first book, didn't really connect historically at all. It was a story almost the backdrop, like a backcloth in a theatre. You know, it didn't, it, the story didn't connect with, with the history. And for that reason, I, I eventually rewrote it to connect with history. So I go in very, very conscious not to have too much exposition, not to try and, certainly not to try and impose any of my politics, for instance, or any of my thoughts about the time on the thing. It's very much about how the characters would see things and excuse me, some of the impracticalities of, of colonial rule. But yeah, but I, I'm conscious all the time and I'm 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 a pretty strict self editor, you know, and if I feel I'm just telling history rather than telling story, I'll I'll stop myself and get myself back on track. And you've been long listed. You've been short listed for mm. prizes. My goodness, your you know your name is really up there. Has that been quite an exciting process? It was a very exciting process. It, the, the first two prizes were I was, I was long listed for the McIlvanny Prize at Bloody Scotland and short listed for the Scottish Crime Debut of the Year the same year. But I heard about this about three weeks after the book came out. So I was still in the position of being kind of slightly stunned and disbelieving that I had a book published. You know, that that was such an achievement in itself. And then three weeks later, I heard that I'd, I'd, I'd been uh, long list and shortlisted. So it was it was a real whirlwind because the book came out in June and then I was on the stage at Bloody Scotland in September. And then subsequently, it was, it was shortlisted for one of the CWA daggers last year and also for the Niall Marshall Award later in the year last year so yeah it, I, I still don't quite believe it to be honest <laughs> I know these things happen but I, I shake my head sometimes when I think about it and we should just mention Hobet Books our friends at yes, Hobet absolutely. Books because they are your yeah, publishers they are my publishers so Hobet have been going about three years now so when I first started talking to them I think they'd been in business a year to 18 months and I'm just so grateful to them for a taking a risk on, on a book that could be take to be a bit niche or a setting or a the characters, are, you know, not not the absolute mainstream of crime fiction. So, you know, more kudos to them for for taking that risk and then just doing such a superb job and producing them and getting them out into the world. And they work very hard. Yes, I was just going to say, my goodness, they they are hard workers. So they're good to have on your on your side, on your team. And if the characters of Chasing the Dragon stayed with you since you finished the book, are there any? Again, no spoilers, but are there any sort of whispering in your ear? Yes. So a colleague of the archaeologist who dies plays a, a, a kind of major part in the story. And she, yeah, without, without to, 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 to give away any spoilers, I wish I could no. write about her again. So I may find a way of doing that. She's She has a natural ending in this story, not, nothing bad, but she has a natural ending in the story. So in the future, I would quite like to bring her back because I just enjoyed writing her character. <laughs> Some of the other characters, uh, Betancourt and Dr. Evelyn Travos, who's the police doctor, will definitely be staying. And Quek, who's, who's Betancourt's assistant, they'll definitely be staying. But yeah, I think it's the first time I've had a character who's, who's had had their time in the story, as it were. But I'd say, oh, I wouldn't mind bringing her back and doing something else with her. So we can expect more once we've read this book, that there'll be more to come. Yeah, that's definitely the plan. I mean, I always, the, the original plan when I started writing Away from the Tiger was to write a, a, a cycle of stories that took us up to the Second World War and the Japanese occupation, the uh, like war in Asia, which is, is 41, 42. And as I said earlier, I didn't want to write about the war. I didn't write to write war scenes or any, or any of those sort of horrors. However, I've kind of changed my mind a bit. I still don't want to write about the war, but I find it intriguing from Betancourt's perspective, what he would think of life under the Japanese, because to him, it's just another set of colonial rulers, different, and obviously some 
horrible things went on during that time. But day to day, I'm fascinated to know day to day what life was like under that regime. And I thought Betancourt could be a very good vehicle for for exploring that. Indeed. Well, Mark, we come to the final question, which is the crucial one on this podcast. So please prepare yourself. And that is, what is your biscuit of choice? What biscuit powered the writing of Chasing the Dragon? I have I've made a great discovery in the last few months, actually, and they are um, dark chocolate oat biscuits. Mm-hmm. So that's what I eat, yes. And you get dark chocolate and orange, which are even nicer. Oh, that sounds lovely and almost healthy, one could say. If oh, well, you can, yes, you can definitely convince yourself that they, <laughs> <laughs> they're not too unhealthy. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's just great to talk to you and find out more about Chasing the Dragon. Mark Whiteman, thank you so much. Thank you. Super. And so we move on to the audiobooks. And the first one I want to talk to you about is called The Trial by Rob Rinder. Let me tell you a little bit more about it. Murder deception in the Old Bailey. Meet Adam Green, misfit, purveyor of justice, barrister in training. When hero policeman Grant Cliveden dies from a poisoning in the Old Bailey, it threatens to shake the country to its core. The evidence points to one man. Jimmy Knight has been convicted of multiple offences before and defending him will be no easy task. Not least because this is trainee barrister Adam Green's first case. But it will quickly become clear that Jimmy Knight is not the only person in Cliveden's past with an axe to grind. The only thing that's certain is that this is a trial which will push Adam and the justice system itself to the limit. I really enjoyed this. I was expecting it to be sort of cosy crime, but I wouldn't say it was cosy crime. It's lighter than some crime books but still not fully on the cosy spectrum, if there was a cosy spectrum. I think it's brilliantly narrated, brilliantly narrated, I have to say. Absolutely excellent. Uh, Narrated by Josh Dillon. I'm glad I listened to the audiobook because I think the narration just adds even more to it. It had pace. I wanted to keep listening to find out. I was convinced I knew what was going on right up to the point when I discovered I was wrong. So, so that was good because I never like guessing the right person and it happens so rarely. But anyway, there we go. That's the trial. And now we go on to Bad Blood. Now, this was a book club choice and I went on to see if I could listen to it as an audio book and it was there. It was an abridged version and I thought, oh gosh, I'm really going to miss out. But anyway, let me introduce it, tell you a bit about it and then I'll, I'll tell you more. So this is a non-fiction book. From a childhood of gothic proportions in a vicarage on the Welsh borders through adolescence, leaving herself teetering on the brink of the 1960s, Lorna Sage vividly and wittily brings to life a vanished time and place and illuminates the lives of three generations of women. Lorna Sage's memoir of childhood and adolescence is a brilliantly written piece of work which vividly and wickedly brings to life her eccentric family and somewhat bizarre upbringing in the small town of Hanmer on the border between Wales and Shropshire. The period, as well as the place, is evoked with crystal clarity from the 1940s, dominated for Lorna by her dissolute but charismatic vicar grandfather, through the 1950s, where the invention of fish fingers revolutionised the lives of housewives like Lorna's mother, to the brink of the 1960s. OK, so for once, I enjoyed it. And I was very pleased about that because there's a lot of books for book club I don't enjoy because I'm having to read them when I wouldn't choose to read them, if that makes sense. I, it's very odd. But anyway, there we are. And I enjoyed this one. The audiobook abridged is about three hours. And because of the speed I listened to it, it was about two and a half hours. So I went along thinking, oh, great, everyone's going to love it. And there was one other person that had listened to the abridged audiobook and everyone else had read the book. And it seems like I made the right decision to do the audiobook. Yes, people enjoyed parts of it, but I think they found it harder to deal with the written book. And that's saying something because, yeah, normally they're quite into that sort of thing. Anyway, basically, audiobook, thumbs up. If you're looking for something different, it wasn't, it didn't change my life. I'm not thinking I've got to listen to it again. I'm not thinking I need to read anything more about her. But just finally, something that I have read for book club, I enjoyed. And I was just happy with that. Very happy with that indeed. So that is Bad Blood. And now we come to the last one, which is called The Little Elephant Who Wants to Fall Asleep. 
and I'm going to try and read you the author's name, Carl Johan Forsen Erlin. Now, this is clearly for children, and it is a book to listen to to go to sleep. There are warnings at the beginning, firstly, that they can't guarantee sleep, and secondly, not to be doing something like driving while you listen to it. There was one time when I was listening to it that I actually started laughing because I could just imagine the woman narrating it and she'd be sitting in the studio narrating it with her the iPad they usually use in front of her reading it out and in the next room there would be the editing team, all of whom I imagine would be fast asleep. I just think the minute she started narrating this in the recording studio, no one could stay awake. And they I could just see that they got all these cans of Red Bull lined up to try and stay awake throughout the recording. So there was one night where I was laughing so much at that idea in my head that it didn't work. However, every other time I have listened to it, it has worked and got me to sleep. It is odd and it is silly and it is childish, but there's just so much emphasis on it's time now to go to sleep that it does work. I think if my brain was completely zooming from one thing to another, as it sometimes does, and wasn't ready to calm down to go to sleep, that might be different. But when you're lying there and you're tired and you want to sleep and you just can't, you just can't get a lift off, then yeah, have a have a listen. I've got this weird eye mask thing that has speakers by the ears. So I put that on so it's dark with the eye mask, but also I can then hear audiobooks or podcasts in my ears. And that seems to work quite well. Anyway, there you go. See what you think. See how you get on. I told you there's some, a wide range of books today. And yes, I was right. Anyway, let's have a quick recap. We have had You Could Be So Pretty by Holly Bourne, Chasing the Dragon by Mark Whiteman, The Trial by Rob Reinder, Bad Blood by Lorna Sage, and The Little Elephant Who Wants to Fall Asleep. <laughs> there you go. What will I review next week? Who knows? Anyway, I'm off. Just look after yourselves. Send you all a big hug. And oh, and I should say we're into the Ellie Griffiths, the Zigzag Girl book club on the Facebook group. So do join us there. You can catch up very easily. You haven't missed out, but we'd love to have you there. So do log on to the QuickBook Reviews Facebook group for more information on that. We're doing it in chunks. So throughout October, we are reading it. And just look after yourselves and I'll talk to you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.